What would an atheist New York media elite, his term, by the way, want to ask an evangelical Christian professor? Well, you're about to find out. Our guest host today, Adam Davidson, writes for The New Yorker, written for Atlantic, MSNBC, Slate Magazine. Adam, you did some fascinating episodes I was telling you about that my brother-in-law, who's a financial planner, loved uh, for This American Life a number of years ago. And I had a chance to interview you a few months back just about your life, your faith, your worldview, your experience. You and I jumped on the phone and said, you know what, let's flip the script. And by the way, before I turn the reins over, I don't know for those watching what Adam is going to ask me. Part of my curiosity is I'm just really interested in what you're going to ask me because that gives me insight into what's interesting and important to you. So thanks for taking a risk to come hang out with an evangelical. I could only guess maybe some criticism you would get, but it tells me a lot about you. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to talk. Um, and, and I'm really enjoying our, our growing uh, relationship because, um, you know, we've, we've talked about how this is a time where people who see the world differently are very likely not to talk to each other and you know i think we're really enjoying getting to know each other i certainly am and agreed um so i the goal here i'm not i'm not going to make you quit your job and become an atheist <laughs> um you can try you're probably not going to convince me um to become christian but but we're gonna hopefully continue to get to know each other better cool. what i want to do i think rough structure, kind of learn a little bit more about your experience growing up, um, kind of the world you come from. Then I did want to get, I had some faith questions and then okay. I have a lot of questions about the role of an apologist. Um, Sounds good. That the very idea of being an apologist is a little weird to me. Um, so first off, like, obviously I'm guessing most people watching know who your dad is. Um, you know, it's funny, your dad, who I've known about for a long time, I'm, even though I, okay. I have no no evangelical Christians in my family. I have no, hmm. um, but, but as we discussed last time I did in college and after take an interest in just understanding evangelical Christianity. So I, I probably have more knowledge than people in my world, but I still don't have a lot of knowledge. about sure. the world. But I think of your dad as like a chill version of an evangelical Christian. Um, I know he didn't grow up in an evangelical world. Um, but can you tell me a bit about your childhood? Like, were, mm. were um, most of the grownups you knew Christians? Was that mm. the world you grew up in? Yeah, that's totally fair. So my dad became a Christian long before he was married, before I was born, was already writing and kind of making a name publicly before I came on the scene. He's a part of Camps Crusade for Christ, now called Crew. So I don't have any memories apart from my dad writing books, speaking on college campuses, debating, etc. That's the world I grew up in. Now, I did grow up in a small town in the mountains of California called Julian. It's kind of a top tourist destination spot in Southern California. It's like an old gold mining town. My public school had 60, I think I had 61 or 63 classmates uh just small town it was there was no private school there so most of the people that we professionally hung out with like when i went with my dad to speak were christians but actually a lot of the people a lot of my friends one of my good friends was a member of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints had friends who were agnostics friends who were christians had a range of friends who were not believers which looking back i i appreciate that I think one of the other things that's interesting is there's a lot of like pastors, kids who just grow up in the church and are just surrounded by expectations to do what their dad does. Honestly, Adam, I don't ever remember my dad saying once, son, you should be an apologist. You should. He never pressed that on me. The, the narrative I remember was, son, whatever giftings you have, just use them to advance the kingdom of God, to follow after Jesus, but didn't pressure me there. So I think it really freed me up to decide for myself if I did or I didn't want to do this. Um, I could go. I don't know how much depth you want me to go into. I have three no, sisters. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, and, I think what, you know, as we discussed last time, I grew up in, you know, all artist community, Greenwich Village, 1970s, early 1980s, yeah. pretty much the exact opposite. Like mm. 
there are more like there were a thousand people in the building I grew up in. There are like well over 60 kids in the building I grew up in, let alone my school and my world. Um, and but we really didn't know about the evangelical Christian world. And I, mm. I'm curious what what your experience of living in America was. You're a little bit younger than me, um, but we were going through a lot of, you know, kind of the culture wars ebbed and flowed. But did you have the experience like I did where there were some groups out there that were very different from you? I mean, you, you, you know, I hear a lot of evangelical Christians talking about the yeah. culture. We're not of this world. We're not of this culture. So I'm just curious how you thought about that. TV shows, Hollywood, just the, the news. Yeah. So th- th- there's some tensions in my experience here. And although my parents, Christians and missionaries, my dad was very intentional about making sure we met and engaged people who saw the world differently. So a, a story that popped to my mind when you're talking is there's in Laguna Beach in Southern California is one of the central like LGBTQ communities, about an hour and a half, maybe two hours from where we grew up. And we go stay there regularly. And we go to this cafe and there was, there was a young man by the name of Jade who is gay. And I remember we'd frequently just go visit him. And I remember one time we're sitting there as a family and my dad goes, Jade, would you share with my family what it's like to grow up as gay in America? (laughs) Now, for some people, that's a jarring question that maybe feels like, wow, how can you ask me that? But I mentioned that because I grew up with parents who were missionaries, but my, my parents were intentional. Let's go to movies that are not Christian, that don't have to preach what we preach. Let's engage people who see the world differently, not just to argue with them, but to learn from them. That was some part of my experience growing up. Now, with that said, there are certain circles that I grew up in, Adam, where I remember being shown a video, and this is probably 30 years ago, of a gay parade in San Francisco. And the narrative was, this is the entire LGBTQ community. It's us it's against them. So there was kind of a tension because I was in different Christian worlds. Sometimes, and my dad's not, I appreciate that he used the word chill to describe him. Now his personality's not chill, but in terms of political engagement, he's not a culture warrior, he's an evangelist. So I wasn't raised with this us versus them mentality, but there was a sense that there's ideas in the world that could be dangerous And we have to be very intentional to not be taken in by faulty ideas, whether it's movies, whether it's the educational system, whether it's, you know, Hollywood or something like that. So I I don't know if that answers, but that's a little bit of an attention, uh, some of the tension that maybe I grew up with. Yeah, no, that I think that that's really helpful. I mean, I've certainly met the more um, judgmental version and. Hmm. Even as an evangelical approach, it just it's just not going to work, I don't think, as much. Um, and, and I guess that brings me up to another question about sort of the work, you know, your childhood and maybe even how you see it now. A view that I've had at different points and a lot of people I know have is when you're engaging an evangelical Christian, if you're not an evangelical Christian, any conversation really is a means to an end that Hmm. um like i sometimes am in an argument and i want to convince someone of it to have a different opinion but i generally am not thinking oh i want that person to have a fundamentally different view of how the world Hmm. works and and you know so i'm curious about that moment with your dad was he modeling what what is the experience of of like hanging out with let's say an openly gay man who isn't searching to be redeemed is it like oh i hope he does is it are, are you able to have moments of real you know really seeing the world on his terms even if you you know see moral issues with it because well, i yeah, I, judge yeah. Every judges <laughs> i i think that's a totally fair question so as a christian because i think jesus is god and what we believe in this life has eternal consequences I want people to believe. I think just like you do, I think my views are right. Now, what's at stake in what I think about reality is different than what's at stake with what you think about reality, obviously. So to me, because I care about people, 
I want to live a life and engage them in a way that they would consider the claims of Christ. If I said that's not in the background of my mind, that would be totally disingenuous. But I don't, but, but the other thing is I also know I can't force anybody to believe anything. I mean, Jesus let the rich young ruler just walk away and that that's between that person and between God. So one thing my father said to me many times, he goes, it's more important to understand than to be understood. You know, the Bible has a ton to say about listening and it's the fool who talks rather than listening. So I found some of my own blind spots. I found just some areas that I just need to grow in and frankly, just enjoyed conversations with people who see the world differently. That's probably another thing back to my growing up that my dad would say, he'd be like, I would much rather talk with someone who sees the world differently we can have a dialogue and a discussion and maybe an argument if it's appropriate to learn than someone who just says what I already believe. And I've come to see the world that way. So I guess when it's all said and done, you know, Penn, I think it was Penn Teller, if I'm not mistaken, who, who was an atheist, if I remember. I might be, di- di- might be mentioning the wrong person. But I think he said, you know, if Christians really think heaven and hell is at stake, they should be willing to share with me. That's an act of love. And if you didn't, you're not loving me. And to come from an atheist, if our worldview is right, I don't know how we can see the world any differently, but I don't think that prevents me from just being in a relationship with somebody, listening, being challenged to think differently, growing, realizing, like you said at the very beginning, and I can't force anybody to believe anything, That's not my responsibility. I think when it's all said and done, Jesus said, love God and love other people. And a great way to love people is just to listen, enter into their world, get to know them, meet them where they are. That's part of what I think it means to be a Christian. Yeah, that that makes sense. I think, I mean, there are ways in which we probably experience those things similarly, but also differently. Like if you call me up tomorrow and said, you know what, Adam, I just, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, you're right. I'm an atheist. I feel like I'd, <laughs> I'd be sad. I don't think that would really feel like, a, I don't think, so. I mean, I, it might be fun. Hmm. I don't know, but I don't like, it's not something I feel like I want, but then again, hmm. my worldview is that the world is chaotic and human beings import it doesn't have any inherent absolute meaning or truth. And Mm. so um, we impose meaning. And in that Mm. sense, I don't have a meaning frame that's better than yours. I'd probably be glad if you were like, I'm going to support all your political priorities. (laughs) But that's That's awesome. I guess it's like, I don't know that I want you to change. Maybe on some specific issue, like... Mm. New York bagels versus bagels in other countries. I would want to convert you to, um, okay. you know, I have harsh judgment if you like the wrong bagels, but fair enough. Um, but I, I guess something I'm, so I hear this idea that the culture, and I think when I hear the culture from evangelical Christians, I assume it means Hollywood, you know, movies, TV shows, um, and then news media. Um, did it feel like, oh, that's the world you're in? Or did that feel like that's another thing that's kind of imposed on your world? How, how did you think about, or how do you now think about cultural production? Um, let, let me take a step back. I thought of something from your earlier question, then let me jump to this. There was a study by yeah. David Kinnaman called Unchristian with the Barn Research Group and interviewed non-Christians how they think about Christians. And one theme was, is that people felt like Christians just wanted to convert them. (laughs) And the studies show that. And I push back on that. And I think that's a mistake. That's almost using somebody instrumentally rather than just loving them for who they are, regardless of what they believe. So if you and some of your friends feel that way by Christians, I'd be like, I'm sorry, (laughs) we need to get better at this. Let's learn. I hope Christians are watching and we can do better at it. Now that said, now, re, if you don't mind, restate your question. Is it how I experience culture, how I try to engage culture? Let me get at what I'm trying to... An idea that I hear Christians talk about that just feels weird to me, like, is some Christians, and I'm curious if you're one of them. So I live in this world. I, I come from cultural production. You know, my dad was an actor. I know... Hmm. 
I know many movie directors. I know many movie writers and TV writers. Like it's literally my world. And, and you know, there's shows I like, movies I like, movies I don't, a lot of movies and TV shows I don't like, but it, it all, I feel like I, the, it, it's all in keeping with the world I live in. And I sometimes hear from Christians, like, they're living in a different world. Like Satan is a real force in the world that there are, um, that there's an intentionality to culture, um, you know, possibly a satanic intentionality to culture or just a deep alienation. The culture wants to strip us of who we are. Culture wants mm. us or our children to believe things that we don't want them to believe. And it, it is hard for me as you know, a fairly well-connected cultural producer to enter that mind frame. And I'm just wondering if that, like, does that resonate with you? Is that either as a kid or now, do you, do you feel like you're sort of a bit at odds with our culture or the big I mean, yeah. culture is such a broad thing. And I'm talking about now, like Hollywood movies, TV shows, HBO, Netflix, all of that. As a whole, I do. So, and let me flesh this out a little bit. If we're talking about kind of the gatekeepers to culture, and again, we mean university, educational system, whatever, Netflix, media, yeah. it increasingly feels like there's certain ideas that are not just in film and in movies, but being pushed in film and in movies that have a very different idea about what it means to be human, the nature of relationships, the purpose of life, than a Christian worldview. Now, what I try to be reluctant to do, unless somebody says it, is I try not to assume I know somebody's motivations. So I assume somebody making a movie is making a movie because they want to entertain people. They probably have ideas that they think are good and want to shape the world through movies and through other things in the way they think is better. I don't disparage somebody for that. I just disagree with their worldview. So I think seeing it that way maybe helps me be a little bit more charitable towards people. But sometimes people come out clearly and say, here is our agenda, here's ideas, here is distinctly what we're doing. And that's where I'll say, time out. That is a very different perspective than a Christian worldview. So to give an example, in 2019, obviously before COVID, there were new sexual health standards that were released through all of California where I live. So I decided to read all of it. And although it talks about things like inclusiveness and openness and diversity, really in all of it, K through 12th grade is one view that is distinctly at odds with a Christian worldview. And if, so I guess maybe I'm more sensitive to it or I see it, because if I thought those things we're talking about, Hollywood educational system, were promoting ideas more consistent with me, I probably wouldn't be likely to see it because that's how I see the world. But because I see the world differently and it comes through in the California health standards distinctly, I'm like, okay, time out. This raises fair questions about Christians sending their kids to public schools and what that means. Now, I'm not going to say the public school system is evil and they're trying to destroy our kids, but I'm saying, hey, Christian parents, here's some ideas that are intentionally being embedded in the public school. Minimally be aware of these and think through how you're going to navigate them with your kids. Right. And that, yeah, I, I mean, one, I have two thoughts off of that. One is, so for me, I don't see that as one group, you know, like even within Hollywood, because I know the world fairly well, I don't see it as one group. And and in, in the sense that me and people like me might see Christians mm. and you're the same as the Westboro Baptist Church and you're the same as, you know, David Koresh or, or any, you know, anyone who's ever said they were Christian, you're the same as. I, I don't see it that mm. way, but there might, that might be... Um, and, and probably one of the reasons a lot of atheists might think Christians are just there to convert us is one of our main touch points is people on the street handing us tracts and asking us, you know, and, and if that's your main interaction. Um, so anyway, so within Hollywood, I see many, many different groups and, and it's actually probably elite groups that actually 
you, you sort of have to earn the right to have an agenda. Most Hollywood is just, okay. please buy a ticket. Please, you know, people are just, hmm. it's a business. And maybe someday we could do a whole conversation just on yeah. Hollywood cultural action. It could be fun. My brother, actually, who, like me, I don't know if he's atheist or agnostic, but he's certainly not religious, for a while had a job at Paramount Pictures overseeing evangelical Christian movies. But it was purely from a business standpoint, not, you know, he never even considered faith of any kind. Um, so so I see subgroups there. And then I have no idea who sets the health standards or what those might be. And I don't see that as the same group I'm from. Although my guess is we would share a default view that if a child expresses that they're gay, you should celebrate that. You should embrace that. You should support that. If a child shares that they're trans, you should celebrate that. I think most people wouldn't want permanent like surgery, but they would be supportive. Like my son's school has three or something trans kids who are very, like everyone makes a point of being very cool with it. And, and um, so I, I, there is a cultural view that probably imbues the majority of people in that world. Although I would say that's because it imbues the majority of people in America. Um, so I guess that then brings me to another series of questions I had about um, oh, my son is saying hello. Oh, I saw like five hellos. That's your son. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. He said he wasn't going to watch. Was watching. Is he at school watching? Um, <laughs> no, he starts school tomorrow. So all right, <laughs> starts all right. sixth grade. Funny. Um, so um, I didn't think he'd be interested. Um, hi, Ash. Hey, so, can, I, um, can, I, can I make one yeah. one quick quick point? Yeah, yeah, please. And we could we could get into at some point discuss the differences, gender, sexuality, all those things. My only point, as a Christian who's looking at this with a more conservative worldview, is words like diversity, inclusiveness, and openness are used, but they'll say invite a Planned Parenthood rep but we're not open to inviting a rep from a local pregnancy resource center. That doesn't sound like openness to me. Doesn't sound like diversity to me. That's where people on my side are going, okay, wait a minute, we're getting one narrative here. That's where I see that and that concerns me. I realize that's different from Hollywood, but when you look at the worldviews of professors and in Hollywood, I mean, by far voting left and seeing the world left, so even if it's about money, the worldview is still going to come through when you tell a story because you can't tell a story without it coming through. So that's just how I I see it in some ways. Yeah, and I don't, in a lot of ways, I don't disagree. I mean, I, this was when I was hmm. at NPR, for example, National Public Radio, I, I was a bit obsessed with it because diversity and inclusion is really important to NPR. I think it's their number one strategic goal. And I support the standard definition, you know, of ethnic and gender and racial just, but I used to say like, we don't, we're covering wars. And I don't know of anyone who works here who has a relative in the military or who's really been personally affected by the military. We probably okay. should. I also, you know, I made a point of learning Arabic and getting to know, you know, Iraqis. Hmm. So, you know, and similarly like gay marriage, I'm strongly in support of gay marriage. I do sure. see it as a fundamental right, which obviously we would disagree on. But I did feel like we should at least know people who are opposed so that we at least can, you know, steel man their arguments rather than straw man their arguments, like really understand the argument. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, it um, w w which doesn't mean we have to become just we agree with everybody. It, it, it we can still have values, but but just to know. So I was very mm -hmm. proud when I ran my own media company. You know, one of my first hires was a young graduate of Liberty University and, okay. and who white, white, straight male. But but um, but I felt like he helped us understand a lot about what was going on politically that none of us had any insight into at all. And um, and so I, I actually agree with you on a lot of that, although at my son's school, if they brought in an evangelical person to talk about his view on gay issues i think that would be like the biggest scandal that ever happened in this so, <laughs> um, so i did want to ask about that that question of who you are a group of so you you've talked a lot about these studies about 
Christianity and this idea that, um, I forget the scholars you've had on to talk about research, but that progressive Christianity and evangelical Christianity really have, are best understood as two different belief systems. Um, so can, can you help me understand, like, who is, what is the world you are a member of and how many people, how would we begin to think about how many people there are in that world? Oh, see, that's a tough question because the amount of Americans who identify as Christians is, I think I just saw a poll, it was like 70%. But then you just start and to look at... If I asked everyone I know, like, who, you know, what are Christians, I'd say that's everybody. That's like mm. the vast majority. You know, that, that, that's, that would be our, yeah. That's really interesting. Now, you look at those same polls and you start to gauge beliefs and certain behaviors there's at least minimally a serious tension between people identifying as a Christian because it certain has some historical cachet in America, maybe some cultural cachet. I'm a good person. I follow Jesus. So that's where I think that 70% is way misleading. Now, on the flip side, I don't think evangelicals are the only Christians. I think that's a certain way of being a Christian. So I'll use the term evangelical. Even though it has some baggage, because I'm not even sure a lot of evangelicals understand what it means, let alone some people I've interacted with uh, in, in the media, I, I'm like, I'm not sure they understand what an evangelical is. It's a little bit fluid. So I guess my group, when it's all said and done, I, I would just try to say followers of Jesus. And there's certain core Wouldn't essential... Stronger than that? Like, say that again? Like believing... My sense is you would go stronger, that you would say believing Jesus is the risen, that Jesus is the son of God and is and was risen, right? You've said if he wasn't risen, our faith. Yes. So when I say followers of Jesus, I would say in line with certain essential beliefs that the church has held from the beginning and more than any other would be the resurrected Jesus. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus is not risen, our faith is worthless. So if someone calls himself a Christian and doesn't believe Jesus is risen, I have no problem saying you are following a different Jesus. And that would be... Said, like I can think of someone I know who would, they would say, Jesus is the greatest man who's ever lived. Jesus' writings guide me every day. I believe his hmm. words were inspired by God. But I think he was more like a prophet than... The risen one. So you would say that's a different thing. That's not. That's yeah, not if what it, I think of. Christian. So, scripturally speaking, in the history of the church, the authority of Jesus as a prophet and the authority of his teachings stem back to his character, which is substantiated in him rising from the dead. Paul writes in Romans one four and makes this clear, confirms that he is God. So I love that somebody looks at the moral teachings of Jesus thinks he's a prophet, but I'd go back to the argument C.S. Lewis and others have made that Jesus didn't just claim to be a prophet. He claimed to be God. He said he would die and he would rise on the third day. Given how central the resurrection is, that's a different view of Jesus and a different view of the church that going all the way back, people would say, time out, you're talking about a different faith here. And we're not debating eschatology. We're not debating how you're baptized. Like these are essential issues to the identity of Jesus that I think historically speaking, I mean, I did my dissertation on the death of the apostles and the earliest record we have of what the apostles preached was that Jesus was risen. We have no early Christianity without that. And it's been a staple through the history of the church. So if you get rid of the resurrection, according to Paul, when I would say, you're no longer talking about the historical Jesus in the way the Christian faith has talked about him. Right. And then what about the inerrancy of the Bible? Is mm. that crucial? So like that, if that's I believe, a, yeah, yeah. I believe all that's true, but then I believe a generation or two later, a bunch of very earnest people, possibly inspired by God, wrote documents that may or may not, that have mistakes, contradictions, etc. But there was that resurrected Jesus that they were responding to. So when you say, is inerrancy crucial, the question would be crucial to what? Crucial to being a Christian, being saved? No. I have plenty of friends who and believe... I, that's what I'm trying to, like, trying to yeah. understand like, who the people are. 
Like there are people who say, yes, I'm a Christian. They're pastors and ministers who've devoted their whole life to being Christian who don't believe in a resurrected. So that they're clearly a different thing than you. And I'm trying to figure out what other categories. Yeah. Um, so this, yeah. so there are certain essentials you might say are like at the core. If you think of concentric circles, certain core things like Jesus rising from the grave, Jesus being God, Jesus being human, God being triune, salvation by faith. These are certain core essentials that one would have to believe to be a Christian. And you can look at this historically and you look at this biblically, what the apostles and what Jesus taught. Then there's secondary issues that are not unimportant, like the intersection of science and faith. How old do you think the earth is? Do you believe in some kind of evolution? Christians differ on those and always have differed on those, but your belief on that doesn't determine if you are a Christian or not. It determines how you read the scripture, maybe how you engage culture. So I think inerrancy is important because I think Jesus held that view of scripture, but I'm not going to say somebody who doesn't believe in inerrancy can't know Jesus and can't be saved. There's been a range of different views throughout the history of the church. What it means for scripture to be authoritative is infallible, is it inerrant. So those are important questions, but not central to whether or not somebody is truly a follower of Jesus. Gotcha. Okay. So so that resurrection is like it seems like that sine qua non, like we Yep. And and what would be your you know, based on the survey data I can't remember if you said it or if I saw it somewhere, someone arguing it's like six percent of Americans would mm. would um, I, what is your sense? What percentage would believe in the resurrection? Yeah. I have no idea how many believe in the resurrection. And frankly, they're kidding me. Some people go, sure, I believe in the resurrection. But I'd say, do you mean as a historical event? Do you mean it metaphorically? Does this affect the way you live in any way? Because we talk about ideas in our culture, like if I believe something, I just say yes and agree with it. In the culture the Bible came out of, belief is more a sense of faithfulness and fidelity. So if you really believe the resurrection happened, it's going to shape the way you live and face death and approach the world. So those kind of nuances, how many really believe it? I have no idea, Adam. I mean, does it... Here's a contra... To me, it feels like a contradiction. Okay. That I feel and have my life and I think a lot of people from my world feel as if the dominant group is America in America is Christians hmm. and I often see Christians talking as if they are an embattled minority and that the you know America's kind of against them or you know Many would argue, oh, it used to be for us, now it's against us. Although I find that funny because the founding fathers were clearly deists and not, you know, I, I'd be very surprised how, if many of them believed in a resurrected Jesus. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, do you feel like you're part of like the the main stream of America in, in your faith, like of faith? You know, even though we're, we're seeing a crisis of faith, faith is collapsing. It's still, you know, well, well, well above 50 percent. And the vast majority of those people identify as Christian. So do you feel like you're part of a big group or do you feel like you're part of a medium sized group or a tiny group? Um, yeah, that's fair. I would probably say as a whole, I'm part of a significant minority is probably how I see it. So that 70% of people who say they're Christians, I don't think close to that 70% really believe that Jesus God rose from the grave in the way that the church has historically speaking. So I don't think that's close to being a majority of Americans, but there also is that you're hinting at, there is a certain persecution mindset that can weave its way into the Christian mindset, and it's not just unique to Christians, in my perspective, that underestimate some of the influence and the number of believers that we do, in fact, have today. And I think some of that is just looking at the cultural mechanisms we looked at before. 
And I've seen some people say when it comes to Congress, there's a high percentage who will say they're Christians. When it comes to business, a lot will say that they're Christians. But when it comes to the media, when it comes to Hollywood, when it comes to the university system, that's far, far different and much lower. So I guess I'd probably say to answer your question, a, a good-sized minority that at least in terms of the larger cultural narrative uh, is definitely losing some ground. Right. Um, yeah. Um, all right. There's a whole bunch of avenues we'll have to pursue another day. Yeah, I think but... politics is a fascinating place because I, I, when I imagine what I would be if I accepted a Christian worldview, there's a lot of kind of public Christianity that feels more rooted in judgment and, and scoring points. I mean, that that is a thing I see a lot of, and, and mm -hmm. it doesn't, it, 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 I, I don't buy it. You know, I don't buy that you've really had a conversion. <laughs> Not you, I, I yeah. don't buy it with you. Like, in fact, the mm -hmm. approach you've described, the approach you've described your father as having, and I've witnessed your father as having, is a very, to me, is a confident faith. I mean, a mm -hmm. person who can actually sit with someone who sees the world wildly differently and just have a, chill conversation um has a confidence in their faith and someone hmm. who's um you know I, I i mentioned i have a lot of amish friends i see a quiet confidence in a lot of amish faith hmm. um all right i want to get to roots of faith you and i both have a deep fascination with the world of both the hebrew bible and the new testament and um and, and you obviously have done enormous work in that um so it, it seems to me when with you in particular, like what some of the historical claims you make when, when you're making them in a sort of academic context, they are, they are more narrow and tentative. Like, um, you know, the, the, did, did, were there a large number of people who were martyred because they witnessed a risen Jesus. That's a big question. You know, Bart Ehrman and others will have very, I think, compelling arguments that, yes, the Bible refers to 500 people, but that's not 500. We're, we're not, we don't have 500 different people, you know, submitting with their names and everything. Like, to me, the, his, the actual historical case, you know, if I've had no emotional experience or, or Holy Spirit experience, to me, it feels tentative and it feels like when you when you talk carefully in an academic context it's it, I'm, I'm trying to say this in a in a reasonable respectful sure. way but it does feel like it's not you know one could imagine a non-hidden god where there would be way less room for uncertainty room for disagreement even among believers um and certainly between believers and non-believers so um I'm, I'm curious about that because you, it seems important to you, at least in my eyes, that you have a historically grounded faith. You could imagine someone who says, look, I just know it. You know, William Lane Craig has said, um, my like, if it's one in a million, I'm going for it. Essentially a Pascal's mm. wager, like, I'm not going to test this the way I would test any other logical question. I'm going, I'm because I know in my heart, because I've, I've had that experience, but it, it seems to me you really want to be able to ground it in history. And I'm just wondering why that's important to you, how strong the case is. Um, and if you really are open to a historical case that showed, you know, it does, the evidence is just not that robust. So part of Craig's approach is it with apologetics, he'll say, here's how we know Christianity is true and then how we show that it's true. So he would appeal to a direct experience he had of the risen Lord, that he knows it directly, but then apologetics is showing it to others. That's kind of a distinction that, that he would make. For me, one of the big reasons, I, I guess a few reasons, is number one, when I went through a period of kind of questioning and doubting, was like, is this actually true? Is this real? So maybe it's the way I'm wired. Maybe it's a part of my family. I just can't believe something that I don't think is true. 
I'm a natural doubter of everything, Adam. I'm going to buy you know a new camera. I'm like, is that the best one? I need all the information. Sometimes I doubt too much. It's just the way I'm wired. So when it comes to my faith, given what's at stake, I just feel this weight of like, this better be true. What is the evidence? Where does it point? And then of course, as a Christian, we see passages like 1 Peter 3.15, you know, set apart Christ in your Lord, always be ready with an answer, apologia for the hope within. Give it with gentleness and with respect. Jude 3, it's a task that Christians are called to. So for me, and I guess the other piece on top of that is I get emails almost daily from people just doubting, questioning, whether it's atheists, whether it's former Christians, whether it's Christians trying to figure things out. And that's one of the things I enjoy is just trying to help people make sense of these big questions. So I think the evidence for Christianity is strong. I don't think it's overwhelming. Uh, Some people think the title of my dad's book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, is that it demands a positive verdict. That's not the purpose of the title. What he's saying is we have to come to a conclusion about the identity of Jesus. There's some evidence you can't stand on the sideline. It's either for or it's against. It's a prophet. It's a drunk son of God. There is evidence for this person, Jesus. It demands that we come to a verdict is is his approach. So I think God, if I was going to frame it, I think God has given us sufficient evidence. I think good evidence, but I don't think God is going to overwhelm us. I think there's room for us to doubt and reject if we don't want to believe or choose not to. I think God gives us freedom to do so. Now, that's my general response. We could probe some of those particulars, but I think the evidence for Christianity is is solid. I think it's good. And as I've looked into other religions, I don't think it compares, actually, the miracles Jesus did with, say, the miracles that Muhammad allegedly did or Joseph Smith allegedly did. I think there's a qualitative difference that's there. Well, why don't I invite you to become a Jew? Because we have, you know, you have the New Testament, you have the Hebrew Bible already, and then you don't need any, you know, Judaism is, is doesn't, there's not a lot of commitments. I mean, you got to do a bunch of stuff, but, um, but you don't have to believe much. Um, so maybe I will try and become an evangelical Jew. No, we don't do it that way. That's not our, that fault. would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did, this is both in a way, the biggest question and the hardest one to even ask. Like I I mentioned our last conversation, I don't know how to even think about this thing you talk about, God. I just, I Hmm. literally don't, Hmm. when I hear someone talk about God, I don't, I picture the things, it's obviously not an old man with a beard. Hmm. Like, and I don't even know how to ask questions about, like, is God right now aware that we're talking? Does he know our names? Yeah, so let me take a step back. This would be my general encouragement. Obviously, you've read and you've thought about this, so this is not aimed at you in particular. But if someone were to say to me, I'm not sure how to think about God, as a Christian, probably what I would say is carefully read the Gospel of John because in the Gospel, Jesus basically says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. I am God in human flesh. So obviously there's some limitations when he takes on a bodily form and is not present the way 2,000 years ago. But the character of God, the power of God, I think one of the best way is to look at the person of Jesus. That's where I would start with somebody asking that question. Now, of course, God doesn't have a body. God is a mind. And part of being God is God has unlimited power. God has unlimited knowledge aware of the past, the present, and the future, and is aware of what we're saying and what we will say. That would be my view of God. So he's not physical, not located, like say, you know, maybe Zeus, the perspective of God is located. God is in a sense everywhere, but not bodily. Generally, does that begin to help? I mean, I've heard things like that. Just honestly, it just doesn't connect with anything. It doesn't Mm. give me any traction. And the idea of like, well, then we should worship that person. I mean, this is a different conversation. This is the Sean McDowell Q and A, but um, that that's one of my puzzles. I just don't know how. Like, why would that entity care about? You know, there's some Jewish traditions that are like God is not a thing that 
knows we exist, that hmm. he entered history to give us tools that we're free to use if we want to, that can improve our lives. Um, but we don't follow the rules to do him any favors or hmm. he doesn't, he doesn't know or she, or whatever, doesn't know, doesn't care. Um, so I just really struggle with it. The closest I've come at various points is, you know, you know, that feeling of wonder when you look at the James Webb Space Telescope or whatever, that's God. But but I, mm. I really struggle with it. I just don't I don't even struggle with it because I don't care that much. But I, mm. I really can't find traction. Um, can I can I jump in really fast? There, so just in general for people watching, I think there's two ways to do this. There's there's the top down approach where philosophically we can reason or scripturally, what are the attributes of God? What do we know about God? That's kind of a top down approach. Or like the space telescope you described, there's kind of a bottom up approach, something in our experience that hints at God. So for me, when I think like, I, I'm sure you'd agree with this, I look at a waterfall or I look at a galaxy or I look at a sunset, I'm like, that's beautiful. There's something in me that's drawn to respond and say that's beautiful. And I assume you'd agree with me. If somebody looks at a sunset and is like, that's ugly, I'd rather look at my phone, both of us would be like, ah, you're not wired right. You should see that beauty. And we yeah. ought to respond in a certain way to that beauty. Well, I would consider that a sign that this is a created thing. God is the beautiful creator who made this. And that is hinting at something true in God's character. So if we understand, look at a mountain and go, guy, I should stand in a sense of awe and reverence at this. That's a hint of when we understand God's character. It naturally invites us to respond in that fashion. Yeah, I can intellectually take that in, but I still, you know, my mind goes to chemicals and light refraction <laughs> and all the, um, and, you know, some evolutionary process that we might not even understand that, you know, where beauty serves some function. Um, Okay, but um, all right. So I did want to talk about apolo being an apologist because to me that is it's a weird job um, <laughs> in that it's and and I have a hard time reconciling that with also being a truth seeker because it it hmm. you know I speak it crudely I I do know it's not exactly this but just for the sake of conversation it. Well, why don't you just tell me what how you define an apologist? You did a little bit before, but if, sure. can we go back? Yeah. So it depends how broadly we define it. When Plato wrote a defense of Socrates on trial, as you know, he called it an apology, a defense of Socrates. So there's Muslim apologists. There's people like Richard Dawkins who are atheist apologists. There's apologists for the New York Yankees and there's apologists for, you know, the Dodgers. An apologist, in a sense, is just somebody who makes a case for something. Now, of course, a Christian apologist is one who does two things. Plays defense against charges that God can't be three in one. Evil means God is not good. Evolution disproves God. Whatever the challenge is, you play defense, like Jesus did at times in Matthew 22, when they tried to trick him about the resurrection with the Sadducees, Jesus plays defense and shows that the reasoning doesn't work. But he also plays offense, like in Luke 7, when John the Baptist is having doubts, he sends to his apostles, he says, the dead are raised and uh, the blind see. He gives positive evidence that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. So the job of an apologist is to play defense against challenges to the faith, to the faith but also give positive reasons why it's true. Now, personally for me, I don't think there's a contradiction but I think there's a tension that is there. And I'm asking myself all the time, Adam, do I believe this? <laughs> How strong is the evidence? Like, does my confidence match the evidence that's actually there? Am I fooling myself? And the only way around this is I have a lot of conversations with people like you who see the world differently. And I read a ton of atheist books. I mean, this book on abortion rights right now, and it's a debate between someone who's pro-life and pro-choice. And I find myself reading it going, here's why the pro-choice is wrong. But then I try to check myself and go, okay, what's the argument? Is there any truth in this? 
so I don't think there's a contradiction, but I think it takes a real discipline and intentionality to, in fact, make a case for something, but examine how strong or how weak that thing may actually be. Yeah. And, and it's possible that we hold, like my people hold you to a different stand. Like I remember a college professor of mine saying well over 90% of what's happening in a university is just repeating stuff rather than new research, new investigation. And and this was actually a Marxist atheist professor, um, but it's not like every professor of anything or every human being wakes up each morning and says, hmm, I'm gonna challenge all of my beliefs. I mean, I don't know that anyone does that. So sure. it might be unfair. But you asked me, we talked about last time, what would happen? And if I suddenly you know, got a PhD and became an apologist professor at Biola, I would, I would lose the vast majority of my friends. Mm. I have a decent chance I'd lose my fam, much of my family. Um, be a big conversation with my wife that would could go, you know, that would, or if I just became a believer, if I just became a believer and decided to share that fact with people, um, that would be a life trans altering, like a, a completely different life. But for you, it seems even more so that my mm. understanding is be all you have to have a commitment like you couldn't continue to be employed there like can you talk to me what would happen if you yeah i was wondering if you were going to ask me this because i was yeah. fascinated by your answer i think a few things part of me wants to say i wouldn't lose a lot of friends because i have real friends who care about me regardless but with that said i've got a number of friends who are ex-christians and have told me a lot of stories about the way they were treated by Christians that are pretty painful. And they grieve me that Christians would treat people who question in that fashion. So I'm telling you right now, all my apologist buddies, they would call me up, they'd be surprised, they'd push back, they would wanna know what the heck is going on. But I know they would not stop being friends with me. I think they genuinely care about me. I have a lot of family and friends who would not bail and abandon me. Now, publicly, I would take a ton of criticism, largely because of what my dad has done and because my name and because I've been so publicly defending Christianity that I probably would get crucified. And for my mental health, I'd probably have to get off social media for a while. That would certainly happen. I would I'd lose my job and I should lose my job. I mean, at Biola, it is a Christian institution, conservative, not, and I don't mean that in a political sense, I mean in a theological sense, it's an evangelical school. So if I had a colleague who said they're an atheist, I'm not angry at that person, but this probably is not the best place for that person to teach for obvious reasons. So I'd have to get another job. Uh, my marriage, I, I don't, I, I know my wife wouldn't leave me. She wouldn't leave me if I became an atheist. But it would create some serious questions and some tensions and obviously some friction that we would have to work through. So it would upset my job, upset some relationships, but I don't think my wife would leave me. And I think I have a lot of friends who would stand by me nonetheless. But it would be, Adam, very painful. And I'd feel like I disappointed my dad. Right, that's a piece of it. We all want to have our parents be proud of us, and I'd I'd be lying if I said that's not a factor. I'm objective. I want my dad to be proud of me. Now I know when I told him that I'm not sure I believed in Christianity years ago, he's like, "Son, I love you no matter what." I wouldn't. I know my parents would not stop loving me, but I know now that I'm a parent. My son just left home four days ago. Like wow. I can see how much that would pain them. So obviously we should do a reality TV show where we switch roles for a year and just see what happens, right? That, that seems like the obvious next step here. I'll, I'll teach apologists. All right. Um, hey, let me, let me ask you this. I have brought yeah. in a bunch of atheists and skeptics to talk to my students. I did this in high school for years. I brought in universalist uh, Unitarians. I brought in atheists. I brought in a number of LGBTQ activists, uh, I've brought in progressive Christians. Would your side be okay with bringing me in for the same reason? Would I be received? 
similarly? Socially, yes. I mean, you could come over and hang out with my friends, but in now I'm not a, but I, I think it would be, it would not go over well. Yeah. I think, okay. I think that it would be very weird if hmm. a college professor, I'm not saying it's impossible and it would depend on the framing and stuff. Um, so I don't want to make a strong statement, Sure, but I'd say right now, you know, certainly, you know, feelings are very hot about, on, on all sides about abortion, about gay rights, about trans rights. And there'd be a lot of scrutiny about what is the topic, what is, um, that would be a tough, tough sell probably. I okay. mean, if it was like a class where we have lots of people on, you know, I could imagine a case where you would. Okay. But, but it would probably, yeah, I think that would be very tough. Um, okay. So, sorry to jump and ask a question. It's yours. Yeah, I couldn't no, resist. I'd, I'd Keep going. think about it. And certainly, yeah, like if my son's, I mean, he's, he's going into sixth grade, but if they, if he came home and said, oh, an evangelical Christian came in today. I mean, they don't they also just don't do that. Like, there's, it's sure. not like he comes home and says they brought in a Buddhist or they brought in an anybody. But if he brought in, if they said we brought in a Buddhist, I don't think anyone would care um, to, like, teach a mindfulness. But if they said hmm. we brought in an evangelical Christian, that would not hmm. go over well. Okay. Um, and I guess that that was sort of my general wrap up was what do you want? like my friends to think about you and your friends. Like what, hmm. I think I told you last time, what I want you guys to think about is like, we're, you know, we want to be great fathers and mothers. We want to have close family ties. Like sometimes I see Christians talking about atheists or secular people as if we're just a bunch of libidinous, you know, just ravenous monsters and i'm like no no like most of my day is like wanting my son to be proud of me and mm -hmm. and wanting to do work i care about um what do you want my friends to think about you and your friends you know what what i guess i would just say try to understand why a christian believes what a christian believes and where they're coming from I have a whole lot of people who characterize me in a certain way without taking the time to even ask, is that really what I believe? Why do I believe that? And to do so charitably. So I think there's a lot, there, there can be, and again, this goes both ways. I think we both feel this, that there's a decent amount of demonization of the views that I hold. And when I hear people dismiss them, I kind of go, gosh, that's really not what I believe and why. And that, nobody likes that, right? It's like you mentioned Steel Man earlier. I think evangelical Christians, and frankly, we've probably brought a lot of this upon ourselves. So we have a lot to own as evangelical Christians. But I would say just fairly understanding and representing, Steel Manning a Christian position, and being charitable to what we believe and why we believe it. Yeah. I think that's it. I don't, I mean, in some ways, I don't care a ton what people think about me. I mean, I have, I don't have the thickest skin. And when people say stuff, yeah, it hurts. But when it's all said and done, I'm not trying to win the approval of people. I just look out and I feel like, gosh, you and I are connecting. We're listening to each other, we're learning from one another. We've lowered the temperature down a little bit, and maybe someday we'll get to some of those debates, and I'd be fine with that. There's a, there's a place for that. I just feel like so many times people are so quick to stereotype me, stereotype Christians, put them in a box, and then you can write somebody off and not have to take them seriously if you do that. And I think it's unfortunate, and I think it's uncharitable. So if I've done that to you and I've done that to your side, I apologize. I'm a, I'm a work in progress and I don't want to misrepresent somebody. And even part of our conversation have made me go back a few times and be like, you know what? Why do I hold this? Is that fair? That kind of process, I think there's some issues, you and I have said it. You mentioned same-sex marriage. We talked about abortion. Whatever these issues are, we're going to have some serious divides over these issues and advance what we think is good and true for America. 
but can we do it in a way that doesn't demonize people? So sometimes, I guess to answer a question, sometimes I feel like I try to be charitable and say, okay, why does the person hold that? Where are they coming from? If you held their worldview, you'd probably see the world that way as well. But I don't feel like that courtesy is extended to me in the same way I try to do it by many people. Now, maybe it's just the few people that are loud and have a voice and attack me, and that's not representative of all. Part of it is, there, and part of it is you are extraordinary. Like you really, and I'm not saying this just because we're on your channel. Like you, there's a, I don't want to list names, but I watch a lot of Christian YouTube. I'm not even sure why I do. You're the <laughs> only one I've reached out to. You're the only one. Like, really? Most of them, I wouldn't, if they emailed me, I'd probably ignore it. Huh. So I'd say you, you are extraordinary. And, and I would say I'm unusual in my work. You are. Like um, in that I'm at least open to this conversation and curious and, and eager to understand. Mm. Um, but maybe, I mean, that'd be wonderful if it, if it generated others to think that way. Mm. I great. love it. All right. Well, I hope we That'd continue this again. Um, this was really, this was a joy to me to just be able to put you in the hot seat for a while. Well, this is fun. Super intrigued by the questions. Great job. I can, tell you're just going out of your way to be respectful to me and to my viewers which i can't thank you enough for approaching it that way you are exceptional too adam i'll be honest when you first reach out to me my first thought was like this media guy he's got some hidden agenda it took me a little while to warm up and was like you know what what am i afraid of i started looking at your stuff i'm like he has strong opinions but very different in how you're engaging people and uh, I'm sure glad we've had a couple conversations and I hope we've got many, many more coming up. No, I hope so too. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe I'm just running a long con and I'll really get you, but I'm, I'm just building up. The... No, I'm just kidding. Um, this has been really hey. important to me. I'm really enjoying it. I'm, well, I'm really meaningful. Likewise. I, I Thanks. Like there's so many reasons to feel despairing about, can we all share this country and this planet? Mm. And, and talking to you makes me feel like, oh, well, maybe we can. Well, I, I feel the same. There's a lot of focus on differences and those differences are not un unimportant. Life and death is at stake in some cases. Yeah. But I think our common humanity, and you even told me a couple of times we had a rescheduled meeting because you're taking off time to be with your son. I think I did the same with my son. Just talking with people humanizes the issue and takes it down from us versus them. I think I get the impression that's something you and I amidst our differences care about so let's follow up and have another conversation in due time. I would really love that. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks Adam. For See you, buddy. Good answers. Yeah, take care.